morning, everyone. My name is Ryan McDonald. I am the ministry intern here, and I'm going to be reading our scripture for today before we get into the sermon. And so if you'll open your uh, Bibles to Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7, we're going to be starting in verse 13, and I'm going to be reading from the CSB version. I'll go ahead and I'll start reading, and then we can pray and launch into the sermon. All right, Matthew 7, verse 13. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who go through it. How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life, and few find it. Be on your guard against false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravaging wolves. You'll recognize them by their fruit. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree produces good fruit, but a bad tree produces bad fruit. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, neither can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, so you'll recognize them by their fruit. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does, does the will of my Father in heaven on that day in many... Okay, sorry. I lost my place. Lord, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name, drive out demons in your name, and do many miracles in your name? Then I will announce to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you lawbreakers. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the rivers rose, and, cl- and the winds blew and pounded on the house. Yet it didn't collapse, but its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, and the rivers rose, and the winds blew, and pounded that house, and it collapsed. It collapsed with a great crash. When Jesus had finished these, saying these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching, because he was teaching them like one who had authority, and not like their scribes. All right, please pray with us. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you so much for these words, God, that you have spoken to us. I just pray, asking, Lord, that you would open our hearts Open our eyes and ears, God, to receive what it is that you have for us in this text. We love you, and we thank you so much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Ryan. Ryan did a great job last week uh, with our scripture. Looking forward to having him speak again. We are ending our time in the Sermon on the Mount this summer. And if you've never read Matthew 5 through seven, I encourage you to go and read that and put it into practice. Very famous passage of scripture. Even non-Christians know some of the verses, uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Um, I love what um, R.T. France says about these. He says, the teaching of the Sermon on the Mount is not something to be simply admired, it's to be obeyed. And so we're going to look at that today how we last in life. And uh, that's our topic today, the lasting life. And our big idea is a question. It says, the lasting life is a choice. The lasting life is a choice. Now, what I mean by lasting is persevering, is persevering to the end. Anybody watch Olympics? Anybody? Anybody watch any of the Olympics? You know, it's the time four times a year we care about swimming. Y'all know what I mean? You know, (laughs) with those Olympic sports, you never watch, but when they're on, you watch them. And uh, we've been watching some swimming. We've been watching uh, yesterday. They had the track and field and some other things like that. And for some reason, the Americans, like, we, we win gold. But, like, for some reason, they we're about to win gold, and then somebody passes us at the end. Like, that just keeps happening over and over and over. I don't know that we lead the gold medal count, I don't think, right now. Uh, we lead the total medal count. But it got me thinking about endurance because, you know, you could race a really good race, but if you don't finish, you don't win the prize. And so that's what, when we talk about what does it mean to follow Jesus, I, I know some people have talked about this concept of once saved, always saved, or losing your salvation. What does that look like? Here's the deal. Those who follow Jesus will endure. We will stumble and we will fall. But ultimately, our life is not built on sinking sand. It's built on a solid rock. And I love that we sang those truths this morning. On Christ the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. And that is how we get to our first point. 
is that in Christ, the lasting life is distinguished. The lasting life, the enduring life is distinguished. And we open by reading those verses about entering the narrow gate. Let me read those again in Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. Enter the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many ways to get through it. But how narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life, and few find it. Here's the promise of of being a follower of Jesus. You're always going to be in the minority. Uh, You're always going to be in the minority. Even the Great Commission doesn't, uh, even though we're called out, we're given all authority, we're given power by Jesus to go and make disciples. It's not a guarantee that people will respond because what? The lasting life is a choice. Yes, God is in control of salvation. He brings us to himself. He seals us until the day of redemption through his spirit. But he ultimately gives us a choice. Now, I don't know how those two things work together, that God's in complete control making it happen, but we have a choice. I don't know how that works, but God does. And he is everlasting and he is good. And what we're told is that the gate defining him is narrow. This word in the Greek for narrow means trouble or difficulty. I hate to break it to you. Maybe you grew up, maybe you listened to to a preacher online or on the TV, or maybe you grew up in a church that told you that following Jesus is all about blessings. And yes, you are blessed in Christ, but that does not mean things won't be hard. My family, we followed Jesus when I was when I was young, but it doesn't mean y'all can ask my mom in the back row. Like things were not easy. I had an abusive father, grew up poor with very little trailer park in Laplace when I was younger. Like nothing wrong with living in a trailer, but I'm just saying, like, we didn't have everything. Our kids, our kids, here's the point where a pastor's kid gets nervous because you're using them as an example, right, Elijah? You know, like your dad did. You know, so but our kids sometimes they don't want to eat certain foods, you know? They're like, I don't I'm not in the mood for this. I'm not moved for that. And we have to share with them about like how blessed they are because and we have to be reminded of this. I remember my mom could tell you there were times we didn't have money for food. Like, our kids don't realize that actually, I'm saying kids, I'm not talking about my kids, I'm just saying all of us in general don't realize that there are kids in our public schools who go home over summer break and don't have food to eat. Um, There are many ministries that serve families in need. There's poverty even here in our city. Following Jesus doesn't mean that you're guaranteed to have things. But what it does mean is that even when you're in lack, he will provide if you trust him and you rely on him and you persevere in his promises. So the word narrow there in the Greek means difficult or troubling. The word broad, broad is the way that leads to destruction. The word broad means prosperous. Y'all get how false it is when someone, some false teacher, like we'll talk about here in a moment, guarantees that following Jesus will bring you prosperity. That's the broad way. That's the popular way. Following Jesus does not mean you will have everything. Not everything you want, but you will have everything you need, which is him. And that's why we're told to be on guard. If the lasting life is going to be distinguished, we're supposed to be on guard, to be alert, to be watchful against wolves, is what what he calls them. False prophets, false teachers. Maybe you've heard these verses before about not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. They will say, haven't I prophesied in your name? Haven't I cast out demons? Haven't I done all these miraculous things in your name? And then God will reply to them, depart from me. You workers of lawlessness, you lawbreakers. And I remember as a kid, that scared the snot out of me. I was like, how do I know I'm saved? Like, is it a prayer? Like, what does it mean to be saved? The broader context here is not to create doubt. The broader context of what Jesus is sharing is to show us that not everyone who gives lip service is saved. Do you all know people like that? Like, not everyone who gives... Lip service is who they say they are. And in fact, we live in a a city that knows uh, full well about light and darkness. Like, y'all know, people come to our city 
to go on voodoo tours, you know? It's not something most of us do, but something that tourists do. We live in a, a dark city. There's a lot of oppression, even out here in Kenner in the suburbs. We, we have it everywhere. But what we know is that darkness is darkness because there's no light. And Jesus said earlier in chapter 5 that we are the light of the world, a city on a hill that can't be hidden. And we're supposed to let our light shine before others so that they may see our good works and give glory to our Father who is in heaven. So how will we know what is truth and what is light? We're told that we're going to be able to distinguish them by their works. That does not mean the miraculous in the moment. That means when things start to shift and things start to crumble and things start to fall, you really see who they are. We have television. I'm not going to call out any particular church, but we have, we have churches in our region that have vast television ministries. A hurricane hits, they raise money, and you don't hear from them. They do very little. That's why a sister church of ours, good friend of mine, Brandon Langley at St. Rose Community Church, a little small, danky church on St. Rose Avenue, outserved probably anyone in St. Charles Parish after Hurricane Ida. It's because it's not about what you have. It's not about these earthly kingdoms. It's about who you have and who you want to give. That's how this little church, who was just getting started, uh, lost our building even for a year. And that's how this little church was able to serve 10,000 hot meals. Uh, that's how we met Travis and Simona. You know, like 10,000 hot meals over two weekends. How can a group of, you know, 40 or so people do that? Because we serve a big God who knows it's not about all that we have. It's about who we have. And the fact that we, who we have, he enables us to, to get things so that we can give, so that more people will know about him. How do you distinguish false prophets? Well, Scripture says that we're supposed to not believe every spirit. We're supposed to test the spirits. And the spirits that confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and that he's raised from the dead. You see, a false teacher, a false prophet will be, in, will be inevitably found out when things get rocked and when things go bad. Stuart Weber puts it this way, he says, A wolf may get away with his deception for a time, but his true nature will become apparent when his hunger forces him to act like a wolf. Let me say that again. A wolf may get away with deception for a time, but their true nature will become apparent when his hunger forces him to act like a wolf. Scripture says in verse 16 that we will recognize them by their fruits. The fruits are the natural outcomes of our choices and inclinations. Every speaker and teacher of Jesus is held to a higher standard. So we have Elijah and we have, we have Ryan in here training up to be pastors. And, and, and when, uh, uh, actually Ryan hasn't been, or, he hasn't been ordained yet, right? Now, so we're going through that process. Elijah went through that process. And one thing I told Elijah when we were about to ordain him, I'll tell you now, Ryan James 3 says that not many should become teachers. Why is this? Because you will receive a stricter judgment. In fact, Hebrews 13 verse 17 says, teachers, leaders in the church are literally keeping watch over the souls of whom they lead. A good shepherd has to have a rod and a staff. I know we don't live in a country or rural setting, but like a good shepherd has a rod and a staff. One is to bring the sheep back in so they don't dumbly jump over the, the hill or the cliff. The other one's to beat away the wolves. You might have to shoot the wolves. You might have to get away the get get for, get our your sheep away from harm. And a good shepherd has to wield both tools and do it out of loyalty to God and no one else. This is why our scripture verse for last month was the grass withers and the flower fades, but God's word remains forever. The end of the book of Revelation says, anyone who adds to these words shall be added the curses spoken in this book. Specifically talking about the book of Revelation, but anyone who adds or takes away from God's word, who doesn't proclaim the whole counsel or the whole truth of God's word, is not a leader, is not a church that is meant to be a part of. And, and I'm not sitting up here and I'm not dogging we have sister churches who love the Lord in our city. 
what I'm telling you is in a city like ours, where everyone is Catholic, and I'm picking on Catholics here, but if I went north of the lake, everyone's Baptist, you know? In a city like ours where everyone culturally identifies as something, what does it mean to truly be a follower of Jesus? Are you built on what your parents built their lives on? Are you built on what your grandparents built their lives on? Are you placing your hope right now in the rock of Jesus Christ? The lasting life, it's, it's distinguished. We will recognize it by its fruits. It says our grapes uh, gathered among thorn bushes, but figs among, among thistles. And what we see here is this imagery and the way that this is, that the way this is worded in the Greek is expecting an answer of absolutely not. Healthy fruit will do healthy things. It means that followers of Jesus will have a desire to be with Jesus. We will read our Bibles every day. We will pray. We will share, we'll share our faith. Let me tell you, reading your Bible every day, praying and sharing your faith does not guarantee that you're a Christian. Because works don't save us. However, those of us who have been saved by grace through faith will want to do those things. When you're in love with someone, you want to get to know them better. If you're truly in love with Jesus, you're going to want to know Him better. I get the Bible's not always an easy book to read through. If you're looking for all the encouraging passages of Scripture, I hate to break it to you, a good bit of Scripture deals with struggling, hurt, and honestly, a lot of Scripture deals with failure. You have to really love the Lord to read the book of Chronicles, right? You know, <laughs> like you, you have to really love the Lord to get into Leviticus. It's easy to go to the passages that we like. Love is patient. Love is kind. It's harder to go to the passages where Jesus says, unless you drop everything. Unless your loyalty is to me above anything else. You are not truly mine. And so that's the question that I would ask you today. Is following Jesus worth everything to you? Because Scripture says, and Scripture echoes that, Scripture doesn't say this, this is my, my echo of what I see in Scripture, that following Jesus, that anything less than everything is nothing. It does not mean you won't fail. But when you fail, a good father is there to pick you back up and, and say, keep going. It's like when my kids were learning to walk, I didn't kick them when they fell. I was there to catch them when they fall. And if I didn't catch them when they fall and they had a bloody nose, I cleaned off the bloody nose, I picked them up and said, okay, and you know what? They need some help sometimes. How many kids learn to walk by the edge of a coffee table or a, or a TV stand? You know, um, those can be dangerous sometimes, right? I still have a scar on one of my temples. Mom can tell you I hit the edge of a coffee table when I was young. But kids learn to walk sometimes with support. But they eventually model what their parents tell them to do. And looking their parents in the eyes, longing to be like that other person, they they come and they take steps. And you know what? When you take a step, it's a risk. When you take a step, it requires trust. Affirmation that Jesus is Lord is meaningless if it's not backed by obedience. And so we see here that, yes, the lasting life is, is distinguished, but the lasting life, ultimately, to be lasting, it's foundational. You have to ask, okay, yes, we can... We, every, you won't know everyone by like what they do, bad and good. I hate to break it to you. There's going to be a lot of good people in hell. And there's going to be a lot of bad people in heaven. Why? Because your deeds don't save you. Jesus takes good and he makes it, and he makes it great in him. And he, he takes bad and he reshapes it to be great in who he is. And, and what he does is he... He doesn't judge us by what we do, but he's judged us by what he's done. And those of us who have, have found that love will want to long to be like him. And so I ask you, how are you building your life? Like we sang, are you building it on sinking sand? Or are you building it on a solid rock? We in New Orleans are very well aware when you don't build on a good foundation, right? What you get. <laughs> We talk about a city on a hill. We're a city in a valley, right? You know, uh, I think my name actually, Charles is my first name and then Dean's my middle name. 
And uh, Charles means leader. Dean means in the valley. I don't know if mom knew that, you know, when she named me that. Um, little did I know I'd be living the majority of my life in a, in a valley. And it's not easy. How many of us are nervous when the hurricane gets in the Gulf like it is right now? Praying for our friends uh, and family and all that we know. We have family over in Sarasota, Orlando. Um, we supported a church after they got hit by the last hurricane over there, uh, over in Fort Myers, and now they're all dealing with the same things again. And they know because we deal with the same things again. Our, actually, <laughs> on Saturday, we did, we, did, we did garden work on Saturday. It was a terrible decision since it was like 98 degrees or whatever outside. And, uh, but we did garden work yesterday. And y'all know when you do garden work and, and you're... I'm not going to say all guys run to Lowe's, uh, so that would be sexist to say. But one of the people in the, in the family usually runs, makes the Home Depot and Lowe's runs. Y'all know, know what that, that's like? So I, at the beginning of the day, I was like, how many times is this going to take? You know, only, only three. I was kind of impressed. But on the third time, actually the second time, Braden was with me. And Braden asked about, Dad, why haven't we had a hurricane lately? And I'm like, why? I mean, why do you care? Like, why? We don't want a hurricane. But it's like, even our kids just know, like, hey, hurricanes come all the time. Praise God we haven't had a hurricane, Ida. I was like, I don't know if Dad can go through another hurricane, Ida. After we went through Katrina, I was like, I don't know that we can do another one of those. And for those of y'all that are older than me, you remember Camille and Betsy and all those? I remember the May 8th flood when I was younger. Like, all those things. How can we survive these things in a and a bowl like we're, we're sitting in. We survive these things with resilience. Knowing that our, li our life here in Jesus is not ultimately built on nature. It's built on who he is. We can look at our surroundings as an example of why New Orleans may not be here forever. North of the lake might be here a little bit longer because they're higher elevated. They're built on rock. And so what we see is that on Christ, the solid rock, we must stand. And he says at the beginning part of verses 24 through 27, he says, Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like the wise man who built his house on the rock. These words, Jesus is saying that he is, the, he is God. He, he is not quoting any Old Testament prophet. Think about in the Sermon on the Mount, anything he quoted in the Old Testament was to show us how we got, we kind of missed the mark and what the real meaning of the law was, right? That you're not just supposed to not have adultery. You're not supposed to look upon another with lust in your hearts because then you're having adultery in your heart. It's, you're not just supposed to not murder someone. If you're angry with them and you murdered them in your head, how many people murdered somebody this weekend? You know, right? And, and if you didn't, you, you may be fibbing cause, or, or you didn't drive. I think we all murder people in our heads when we drive around New Orleans, right? You know, it's, it's just, you know, we're, we're, we're depraved sinners. But what we see is that it's ultimately not about obedience to the letter of the law with Jesus. It's about obedience to the heart of the law. The letter of the law will play out as we, as we build upon the solid rock of who Jesus is. So I would ask you today, will you trust Jesus as God? Will you trust his truth, his words, that they're all true from Genesis to Revelation? We can't take out the, the verses we don't like. Will you trust them all as true or will you only trust in yourself? There's everyone's longing for truth. Our world is wired to long for truth. We all want some sort of meaning. We find it in drugs, sex, alcohol, men, women, like jobs. We, we all want something to give us meaning and purpose. But the only one who can do that is God himself. Famous theoretical physicist. Anybody ever heard of Stephen Hawking? You remember he died not long ago. He was a guy who's kind of, he was paralyzed. And Stephen Hawking said this in an interview with Fox News. He said, this is coming from someone who is an atheist and denied uh, who Jesus was. He says this, my goal is simple. 
It's a complete understanding of the universe. You see, even people who deny God want to have some sort of understanding and meaning of how the cosmos and how everything works together. My goal is a complete understanding of the universe, why it is and why it, why it exists at all. I regard the brain as a computer which will stop working when its components fail. There is no heaven or afterlife for broken down computers like me. These are only fairy tales for people who are afraid of the dark. Y'all know we Christians, we get accused of that a lot in our world, that we make up things to make us feel better, that God is a construct to help us get through a hard life. Here's the thing about Jesus. You can't just admire him. You have to obey him. When it comes to following Jesus, he's not just, he's not just your hope, he's your everything. When that computer of a brain or of yours, I know some of us feel like we have broken computers, but when that computer shuts down, you will experience one of two things. I hate to break it to Stephen, and he's already experienced this reality. You experience eternal darkness or eternal life. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. How do we know Jesus is powerful? I'm not getting too political here because I, I hate the rage that happens on Facebook. And y'all ever notice my personal, like, I rarely ever share anything like, a, like as far as that's concerned. But y'all remember, well, the rage this past week has been about the, the boxer situation. The rage the week before is about the Olympics opening ceremony with the Last Supper depiction, Dionysus dinner, whatever. Very clearly, I mean, they may have meant multiple things, but very clearly there was an illusion. I hope, I hope that y'all know the Last Supper painting is not in the Bible. It's, it's, in fact, very incorrect in how it would have looked. But the intention with that was to be symbolic. And in their symbolism of saying they want to welcome all, what they did was they offended whom the heart of what that painting was looking to depict. And here's why you know there's power in the name of Jesus. Muhammad wasn't mocked in the opening ceremony. Buddha wasn't mocked. Stephen Hawking wasn't mocked. There's power in the name of Jesus. Every now and then I'll go to a movie with Robert. And last night we went and saw a movie together. And you know, when you watch movies, and most thing I get mostly offended about is, and this is a lost art nowadays, I get, it, I get kind of offended when someone takes the Lord's name in vain. Some of y'all type it, and it aggravates me. Oh my goodness is not usually what's meant by the typing of O-M. Y'all know what I mean. There's power and there's respect in the name of the Lord. I'm not trying to be legalistic. No one takes any other name in vain than Christ's name. There's power. Because our world wants to deny the solid rock. This is why Jesus and the disciples, I mean, with his disciples, they were all questioning who he was and this and that. And then Jesus goes, he, he calls Simon, Peter. You read the New Testament long enough, you'll know that Peter's a bonehead, right? I can relate to Peter. Uh, he makes a lot of mistakes. Jesus, I'm not going to deny you. He denies him three times, right? How many of you, I'm like that all the time. I'm not going to do this, but then I end up doing it. Jesus asked Peter, who do you say I am? What we see in Matthew chapter 16, beginning in verse 15. But you, he asked, who do you say them? Simon Peter answers, you are the Messiah. You're the Christ is what some translations say. Christ means Messiah. Y'all know that's not just Jesus' last name. It means it's a title, Jesus Messiah. You are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus responded to him and said, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, 
because flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my Father who is into heaven. And I say to you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of heaven won't come against it, won't prevail against it. There's a big debate about, okay, was, was Jesus saying he was building on Peter? Is Peter the first pope? Is he the first leader of the church? Or is it about the confession that Peter gave? You are the Christ. My cop-out, but I think good answer for that is both. Jesus was going to use Peter's solid biblical confession of who he was. And he was going to use Peter as a person flaws and all, to bring the church about to which we even sit here today. One day we talk about heaven and hell. One day in heaven we'll be meted by some of these heroes of the faith. And we will see that, that they're not just elevated among us. They are like us in that they receive the same grace through faith that we have received. And we'll be able to thank Peter for everything that he was able to do. Can you imagine, talk about a lasting life? Can you imagine when your son or your daughter, your grandson, maybe your great, 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 great grandchildren, when they meet you in eternity, they thank you for the faith that you laid down for them. Remember, the teachings of Jesus isn't something that we just admire. It's something that we are called to obey. Then we go down to verses 28. I'm going to read through chapter 8, verse 1. It says, When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished. The word in the Greek for astonished means that they were overwhelmed. They were overwhelmed to the point of action. They weren't just admiring who Jesus was. They experienced who Jesus was, and they wanted to do what Jesus said to do. The crowds were astonished because he was teaching them like one who had authority and not like just one of their religious teachers, their scribes. It says in chapter 8, verse 1, and we're going to go, we're not going to continue in Matthew, but in the coming weeks, we're going to talk about what the, the implications of these verses are. What does it mean to live a life on mission? When he came down from the mountain, large crowds followed him. If you read on in the Gospel of Matthew, you will see that Jesus then starts to heal. Literally, a, a man is cleansed. The leper is healed. Like Jesus goes and he heals. He puts everything, all the power that he preached about, he puts it into action. And his disciples and his followers get to experience it. Jesus didn't just say, follow me blindly. He said, follow me and I will show you how to do it. And we're given that same promise today. All Jesus wants us to do is spend time with him. All he wants us to do is commit our lives to him. You see, we can't stand upon the, 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 the mountain forever. Some of us really just, we want to, y'all remember the transfiguration, if y'all know that story? When, when uh, was it Moses and Elijah appear on the mountain and and, and, the, and the disciples are like, can we make tents and all that? And Jesus says, don't make tents. Like, we're not meant to stay here. There is work to do. You've got to get off your, your high horse, off the mountain. And you've got to go down into the valley. And the valley hurts. The valley takes effort. The valley's hot. We know the valley's hot, right? The valley's hot, right? It takes a lot of work. But to climb the mountain of, the God, of God, we've got to go through the valley. And it's not in the valley of the shadow of death. He's there with us, right? Psalm 23 tells us. You can't stay on the mountain forever. You've got to get to work. One of my favorite movie series is Indiana Jones. And in one of those movies, Indiana Jones, he's riding a motorcycle through a library and he crashes and one of his students is asking him a question about a, about a test, and he tells them, you know what, son, sometimes to be a good archaeologist, you got to get out of the library. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be in the library studying God's Word, but it means that our truth, we can't just say, Lord, Lord. We can't just say, this is what I've done. We've got to believe He is who He said He was, and we do those things because of who He is. 
We talked about darkness earlier. This scripture is a, te- is a testament to the fact that miraculous deeds can be done through demonic influence. Didn't I cast out demons in your name? Didn't I prophesy in your name? Like, didn't I do all these things? The deeds aren't, uh, aren't, the, end, uh, aren't the end all be all. Sometimes Jesus is just looking for what obedience looks like when it's hard. We're all, we're attracted to the miracles. We're attracted to the good things. And those things do exist. I've known pastors on the mission field, literally people risen from the dead. The power of God on the move. But we're not just supposed to seek after those things. We seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things will then be added unto us. And for those of us who've been in church long enough or been in a spiritual state long enough, there's this concept I was reading about in a book called Dangerous Calling by Paul David Tripp. It talks about this concept of visual lethargy. A lot of artists will talk about visual lethargy. What it means is that when you see the same thing over and over without really taking time to ponder it, you, you, you pass by without little notice. That the way that concept can be in play is that you don't really care half the time, like all the nuances of the way your home looks, but people are coming over and you look with new eyes, right? You look, where's that, where's that trash that my kids left out? You know, like where, where's that, where'd the dog, you know, scratch the wall? Like where your visual lethargy is when you get so used to something that you're not affected by it. Let us never get so used to following Jesus that we become bored with, with what he's called us to do. May we be people who long after him each and every day. May we, be a, a, may we build our lives on a lasting foundation, a confession of who he is, just like Peter confessed that he was the Christ. May we build upon that truth and may we do what he has called us to do. And I'll close with this. Greg Laurie has an awesome book uh, called Tell Something. It's talking about telling and showing people about Jesus. It said, it's been said, if there's one thing that believers and non-believers have in common, is that they're both uptight about evangelism. If you don't know what evangelism is, it means telling people about Jesus. If there's one thing that both believers and unbelievers have in common, is they're both uptight about telling people about Jesus. For many, the Great Commission, which is to go and make disciples, has instead become the great omission. Clearly, God could reach people without us, but instead, he has chosen to work through us. In fact, and I, I got to say amen to this, in fact, he seems to always go out of his way to find the most unlikely candidates to accomplish his divine purpose. You don't need to be the perfect person because he is. Will you follow him today? Will you build your life on him? Will you follow him down from the mountain into the valley and get to work? Seeing the miracles of salvation, seeing the healing of the spirit and the soul. Who do you know where you live, work, eat, and play that needs that hope today? Who needs to build on the lasting? foundational rock. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for who you are. God, I, I thank you as we, as we really think about the lasting life being a choice. God, I thank you that we get to ponder this question of will we follow Jesus today? Will we follow you today? Will we give you everything? Because Lord, we know that anything less than everything is nothing. Jesus, you know that I'm not perfect. You see me when no one else sees me. But Jesus, you know I love you. And you know I'm committed to you. And God, I pray that every person here in this room today would commit themselves in the same way. God, help us to build our lives upon that truth 
that hope and that promise that you are Christ. You are Messiah. You are our Savior. Help us to follow you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.